Hello and welcome to episode 31 of the 1 160th of a second photography podcast. In my last episode I spoke about my top 5 cameras so it now makes sense to talk about my top 5 lenses. This episode is sponsored by purpleport.com. So in my last episode I talked about my top 5 cameras and there might have been a few surprises in there for people. When I talked about my top 5 cameras I only limited myself by the fact did I still own the camera? I didn't think it was right to put a camera in a top five if I didn't own it and I'd sold it or I'd got rid of it or I'd given it away. The question is, if it was good, then why did I go and sell it? So it could not have been good, in my opinion. In this episode, most of the discussion is going to centre around what interchangeable lens camera systems I have. And the interchangeable lens camera systems I have are Canon and Micro Four Thirds. And again, like in the last episode, I will only put lenses that I still own in the top five. Any lenses I've sold will not be going into the top five. One thing I will say is that when considering lenses to put into my top five and ranking them, I have considered how they behave on the cameras I have. When putting my list together, my top five were exclusively Canon fit lenses. So in Canon, I have a full frame DSLR that doesn't capture video and an APS-C camera that does capture video and is used for video mostly. So when I was ranking my top five, I had to consider, amongst other things, how well they behaved on both my cameras in both those use cases. And at number five is the Canon 85mm f1.8. This lens suits my style of DSLR shooting. I typically shoot with the DSLR when I'm shooting portrait or fashion work. Otherwise, as you might have picked up from my other episode, I might use a compact camera for other sort of shooting scenarios. But fashion and portrait work will always be a DSLR for me. The 85mm focal length is ideal for this type of photography. On a full frame, this lens is great and it is a great focal length. If I were to criticise this lens, I would say there was a problem with chromatic aberrations on this lens, but it's not insurmountable and it can easily be overcome in Lightroom. On an APS-C body, the focal length is 135mm, which is still a very good choice for portraits and it does give better compression than the 85mm focal length. But I don't find the images on an APS-C body are that good with this lens, particularly when we start comparing to other lenses on the APS-C body. At this focal length, there's limited use for video 135 millimeters certainly not going to be using for video and the lens doesn't have image stabilization so that's particularly important in using a telephoto lens for something like video the lens itself is lightweight and it's simple to use and i've done shoots where i've just taken the lens and the camera in a small bag because it's a lightweight lens and it does the job fine on my full frame In at number four is the Canon 35mm f2. This lens gets a lot of use in video work. On the APS-C body, it's approximately 15mm in focal length, which is a good focal length for video. The lens goes down to f2 and it has image stabilisation. And both of these make it a good choice for my video work. The lens is very small, but it seems incredibly well built. I've got a third party lens hood always on the lens because the Canon one was ridiculously expensive and it didn't come with a lens hood even though it is quite a premium lens. I've used this on my full frame DSLR for street photography and I've got some amazing images. Although I do prefer to use small compact cameras now for street work as I'm lighter and I'm faster and I'm also seen as less threatening. This lens gets the most use on an APS-C body but that doesn't mean I wouldn't use it on a full frame body. In at number three is the Lens Baby Composer 50mm. I have three 50mm lenses. Why would I have that, you might ask? Well, each one has a specific USB. The Lens Baby Composer gives some really dreamy, out of focus images, and it gives you images you can't get with other lenses. The lens is small and lightweight, which is a tremendous bonus, but it does have manual focus. The reason I like using the lens is it allows me to get some really unique images. The lens is effectively a tilt shift lens. It's not a true tilt shift lens that we use for architecture, but you can move the focal plane around and get some really interesting results. And that result is certain areas are out of focus and certain areas are in focus. And this creates a really unique image that looks really good depending on how you use it. So I use this for portraits, but I've seen the lens used to convey motion because it creates a blur. And I've used the lens to sort of create that miniature model look. Now the lens is natively an f2 aperture and you adjust the aperture by adding these small black discs and you might think that's a bit of a hassle and i suppose it is rather than moving a dial on the lens or or pressing a button on the camera discs are magnetic they come within an attachment tool so you take them out of the attachment tool you stick them on the end which is magnetic and you push it in and it clips into place and you remove it just by doing the same in reverse so with adding the aperture blades And with doing manual focus and with adjusting the focal plane, this is not a lens to use for speedy shoot, but it is a lens that will give you a very unique 
image and a very unique look. And that's really what Lens Baby is famous for. I've also got a fisheye optic that I can swap out with the 50mm optic. And I think you can swap out and replace it with a 35mm optic if you want to. The lens is fun, but you've got to be really careful not to overuse the effect. Otherwise, it, it's not special anymore. It's what you always do and you're not differentiating yourself. In at number two is the Sigma 50mm f1.4 art lens. I love this lens. This lens is amazing. This lens is built like a tank. It comes with a really good lens hood and an excellent, really well protective case. Focusing is quick and accurate. It goes down to f1.4 and you can always get great blurry backgrounds with this lens. And this lens is the lens I use exclusively for low light work. In terms of image quality, this is probably one of the best lenses for image quality that I own. And it, it does give me the best image quality on either the full frame or the APS-C body. Contrast, sharpness and colours are all excellent. And it's a solid performer on the APS-C as well as the full frame camera. On the APS-C body, it gives an approximate focal length of 85mm, which again is really good for portrait work. So when doing fashion or portrait, I'll often take this lens with the APS-C body rather than the full frame with the 85mm lens. So there's no image stabilisation on this lens, but I can understand that because this is such a fast lens. And for a long time, this was my favourite lens until... So number one, which replaced the Sigma 50mm f1.4 art lens as my favourite lens, is the Canon 200mm f2.8 Mark II L lens. And I bought this lens used, and it came with a lens hood, and, and that was it. It's heavy, but it is well built. Its build quality actually, is, I, I think, rivals the Sigma. It's ever so slightly better. And what I like about this lens is it makes backgrounds really creamy and out of focus. Because it's such a telephoto lens, for me anyway, compared to my other lenses, it does compress the background and it does blow everything out of focus. So this is ideal for location, portrait and fashion work. Because even at f2.8, it gives a far better defocused and out of focus background than the Sigma 50mm. It has great compression. Now I've only ever used this on a full frame camera, but I could use this on the APS-C camera if I was a wildlife photographer, but that, that's not really me. So I did travel to a location shoot with this lens, and in the background was scaffolding and other things, and it, it wasn't really a great image to shoot against. But I used this lens, and it completely blurred those distractions out. So when you look at the image, you can't see that there's scaffolding and there's people walking about because they've been blurred out completely. And it's a sharp lens as well. I don't think it's quite as sharp as my Sigma 50mm, but it is sharp nonetheless and it does give very good images. So because of the look that this lens gives and because of the versatility it has in terms of taking it out and doing location shoots, Again, where you might find a background is not very good. This is my number one lens and I really like it. You can shoot in a completely shoddy area and you'll still get a good image because the background will be out of focus and whoever's in the foreground will be nice and sharp. Downside to this lens is there's no stabilisation, which this lens does need really. So to get sharp images due to the telephoto nature of the lens, you need to have high shutter speed. Now I'm not a, a huge believer in the reciprocal rule where you need to shoot faster than the reciprocal of your focal length, so i.e. you need to shoot faster than one two hundredth of a second with this focal length. I, I, I don't really think that, that holds stop. You cannot get away with using a shutter speed of under one one hundred twenty-fifth of a second with this lens. And if you do, you get blurry images. So on an overcast day, what that means is you've got to bump up your ISO. With this lens, I'm shooting with a higher ISO than I would be on other lenses. But those are my top five lenses. You might ask, why haven't I included any Micro Four Thirds lenses? Because I do own a Micro Four Thirds system, and I do have some Micro Four Thirds lenses. Well, I think that is a podcast for another day, really, my feelings on Micro Four Thirds. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Don't forget to head over to the Patreon page if you want to support this podcast at patreon.com forward slash 160 SPP. And I hope to see you, well, don't hope to see you. I hope you'll be listening to other podcasts. Thank you. Goodbye.